Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we're picking up our conversation from last week about the myth of the Nephilim. We didn't actually talk about this next week, but or last week, but it was the next logical step in what we were talking about. And I'm told that there's a very... Um, pernicious theological rumor, shall we say, about the Nephilim and the sons of God in Genesis chapter four. Uh, Rachel, do you want to give us a rundown on what people are saying out there? Sure. So in Genesis six, we come across the word Nephilim in Hebrew, which does appear in other places in the Bible. And from that appearance of this other people, um, there have been those that have said that this is actually angels coming down and taking human women and propagating a new species or race that is superior, uh, but also potentially demonic because these are <laughs> fallen angels. <laughs> it was because they're coming a corrupting down. influence. <laughs> right. So apparently this was the way that angels corrupted themselves. This was the fall of angels was choosing to come down um, to take human women and somehow be able to propagate a species, even though the Bible tells us that in heaven we will be like the angels and not have children. Um, <laughs> so something happened to create this special species that is described later in the book of Numbers as giants. And so uh, here they're called the... Uh, mighty men, which is a mm. term that the Bible uses frequently for those that do great and valorous deeds, both good yeah. and bad. Uh, this is the term used for Nimrod. So he <laughs> wanted to be a mighty man before the Lord, or he was, and that was not good for him. Mm -hmm. But um, so they take this one word, which if you actually read Genesis 6, you do not get that at all. Um, when I first heard this and read the text, I went, Okay, so there's a word there. Why does that make demon babies or <laughs> half angel babies? Um, and they get these ideas by actually reading in the New Testament two places in Second Peter and in Jude, where the writers reference the fall of angels. And it's basically the only two places in the Bible really where we hear that. And even then, we're not given the details. And therefore, they grab from things outside of the text and have um, created this probably the main source of the myth, as you call it. The alternative explanation um, is from the fact that in the book of Jude, he actually references a couple of sources outside of the Bible and what we would consider the canon of scripture. Um, and one of them is known as first Enoch which we find bits of it in like the Dead Sea Scrolls and such. And so it was before the time of Christ and was around during Jude's time. Uh, but he paraphrases it in his letter, not when talking about the angels, but at a different point. And therefore, people go and read First Enoch and they find that story in First Enoch. That's where it seems to have originated, where it says, well, some angels went down and took wives and other angels gave away secret knowledge. And all of these different kinds of things produce the fall of the angels to be demons. And so they're taking kind of a general association of first Enoch and the angels being talked about in Jude to say, ah, we know who the Nephilim are. That must be what they are. But again, there's nothing in Jude that actually says that is what is happening. And Enoch speaks of a number of different ways that the angels fell. And none, no one thinks that the book of first Enoch is scripture. So <laughs> <laughs> it is clear that Jude is using bits of those things, but typically it's to make his point against false teachers, not to uh, encourage us to read those texts. Um, so what we do want to see, though, in the text is... Rather, at the beginning of chapter six, we've had the line of Cain and we've had the line of Seth. Both of those have been set up for us as two distinct lines. And then we come to chapter six and the first verse tells us there are two groups. There are 
the daughters of men or the daughters of Adam, mankind, and they're the sons of God. And suddenly the two groups are no longer distinct, but rather um, the sons of God look at the daughters of men and see that they are good or beautiful and are enticed to marry them. And from their unions, we hear of these Nephilim, which literally means fallen ones or um, those that have been, um, the same word is used for like miscarriage or cast mm. out, cast down. Interesting. Um, so they're, we don't know exactly why that's the term used for them, but. Um, right, because it's never been thought that the sons of God in this context were somehow unfallen. No. They're the children of Seth. That's the the line that's carrying the promise. Um, well, but they're right. not and, exempt from the theological truth of the fall in Adam. Right. Unless you take the previously discussed myth that says the <laughs> sons of God are actually the angels. And mm -hmm. again, we have one scripture reference that can support that, which is that in Job at the beginning, it speaks of mm -hmm. the sons of God coming to his presence. And most believe that those that's referring to angels. But mm -hmm. Adam's also called the son of God. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, men are even in this genealogy. In right. Genesis. Yeah. Right. He is said to mm -hmm. be in the likeness of God. And it's very clear from the text that God's concern is what men are doing, not what angels are doing, mm -hmm. um, which we'll see in uh, cha or chapter six, verse five, where it's not, oh, there's Nephilim. And then the next verse, suddenly God is talking about men. The, those things we should put mm. together, um, yeah. not keep not keep them separated. Because the point is, he says he's not going to abide with men forever or strive with men forever. He's seeing the wickedness of men. He's seeing that they want to go, they want to live forever and have a forever name, but he's mm. going to shorten their life. He's going to shorten their days, um, which again speaks of men who are <laughs> in the covenant relationship. They are those who should be obeying the Lord. And instead he looks and sees they are becoming just like the rest. Mm -hmm. And so instead of this union, we might say pulling the daughters of men up mm -hmm. to the covenant, um, covenant relationship, instead they pull the men down. Mm -hmm. And while in this very humanistic union, they produce mighty men, great men, mm -hmm. men with names that seem like they'll go forever. But instead, it actually produces the destruction of all of them. Mm -hmm. And so we're supposed to see that contrast of men again, trying to do it their own way and doing what looks good to them. And instead, we see these, the mightiest of the mighty are going to be thrown down. And this is the beginning of a long theme through scripture of mm -hmm. the, the men of the covenant being distracted and enticed and mm -hmm. uh, intermarrying with unbelieving women, uh, which God never speaks well of <laughs> afterward. <laughs> no, from Adam on the, a man's failure to uh, his covenant with his wife seems to directly correlate to his failure with his covenant with his God. Um, there's, yeah, we're covenant keepers <laughs> across the board or covenant breakers across the board. And it's... And in this it, case, always covenant breakers. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> yes, to be a covenant keeper, God first has to be our covenant God and keep us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but so I suppose we could say we see God's faithfulness not just to keep us in covenant with himself, but with others as well, mm -hmm. to be able to hold our, our commitments. Now, as we are saying here that the Nephilim are actually human sons, human offspring mm -hmm. of Seth's line and Cain's line, it's important to understand then that they were not on the boat with Noah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they did not, therefore, have magical powers from demons or angels or any such thing. And so we have to understand that they all died in the flood. 
that mm-hmm. that is the point of the worldwide flood. They were amongst the wickedness. So when we see them show up again in the book of Numbers, where the spies go to look at the land and they come back saying, there are Nephilim there, they are huge and we can't possibly take them on. They're not the same group that has suddenly reappeared to challenge the sons of God again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That this is not a single genetical alternative race that exists in the world. Um, They... They died in the flood because they were wicked, but they did did not alone cause the flood because of being demons. And they do not get to continue to be a source of our, you know, blame shifting of, oh, mm. the Nephilim made me do it. Oh, the Nephilim <laughs> yeah. are working in the world. There's a conspiracy. Uh, we need to be very clear that the Lord does not allow such mixing and he punishes humans for mm-hmm. their sin in as they are in covenant with him. And that is not the same way that he um, interacts with angels or demons. Yeah. Um, our and covenant. The, the punishment of God on the earth is specifically connected to God's curse on the earth mm-hmm. from Adam's sin. Right. Uh, it would not make covenantal sense for someone else to be responsible for that destruction. Uh, that falls squarely on the shoulders of mankind. Yeah. There is one other thing that I mentioned before we began. This introduction of a second race, and the word race contains it all. Mm-hmm. This would be another sentient series of genetically developed beings who are still on the planet. And oh, who are came, they? <laughs> yeah. Who are they today? Are they amongst us? I actually saw something on one of my, I think my YouTube feed where it says exactly that. Where are they? Are they who you think they are? Maybe somebody you know is one. And I didn't click (laughs) on it because I don't need that kind of nonsense, but you can see where this goes really easily. It honestly reminds me of the show Battlestar Galactica, Mm. where there's that alternative race and you keep finding out all your favorite characters are actually a part of it and they're all out to destroy everybody else somehow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's, you yeah, know, mm-hmm. well, that it's Battlestar Galactica had its roots in Mormonism, and Mormonism originally was yeah. extremely racist. <laughs> so the dots are all connecting here. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we don't want to take responsibility for our sins as human beings. We've got to put it on something physical or metaphysical, something outside of us that's making us do bad things. The devil made me do it, was Eve's original plea, and people are still there. They're still looking for some selective depravity hmm. but there hmm. there is a, there are particular groups that are evil that are the source of all problems whether it be the jews or the blacks or the whites or women or men or you know you go down the list of who it's uh, in marxian terms pop, um, popular to blame right now and if you can put a theological twist on it and say yes because they're demonic hmm. then then I'm automatically good, no matter how what a lousy human being I am. Compared to them, I'm pretty good. And I can stand on the good guy's side and, and claim that, and it doesn't require true repentance of sin or faith in Christ, just some glib acknowledgement of God and family and, you know, country and such, and then all those people are evil and we should do something about them, like genocide. Um, so th- this, is, uh, this is a relevant conversation. Uh, something related to this very much in, in terms of a proper interpretation is, is what w- was really going on here. Here are the, um, the children of Cain, and we, we've seen that they rushed very quickly into dominion and the advancement of technology and all of that, but pagan culture eventually burns itself out because as it begins to question everything— the reality of God, uh, social bonds, honesty, truth, reality itself, eventually gets to the point where it, as the culture stagnates or even becomes begins to fall apart, which is what should happen. And the godly should let it, honestly. <laughs> um, we don't need to do any rescue jobs. But what happens if at that moment you come in uh, as a godly people and intermarry with such a group. Here they are, true apostates, but you come in and you give them 
godly education, uh, godly science, a belief in the uh, real external universe that works by cause and effect. You give them habits of self-discipline and all. You give them all of the outward training, but no faith because you've compromised your own already. What happens then? Well, well, it's um, not that you can give people faith anyway. No, right? <laughs> but you don't. You don't make an effort to evangelize, and you don't stay away from people who haven't confessed Christ. You you embrace them. It, two examples come to mind, and Rachel, you maybe and embrace interested. their unbelief specifically. Yeah, uh, one about well, where are we? Almost a hundred years ago, um, not quite. There were. Uh, mighty men who rose up in this world. Mm -hmm. Their names were things like Lenin and Stalin mm -hmm. and Hitler and later Castro. And most of these Mussolini, most of these men came out of a Christian background. Some of them were seminary students or, or they'd been church acolytes or choir members. They'd had education in the best Christian Western universities. They had the discipline and the training and they had none of the faith. And in fact, they hated Christianity. And what we got was some really scary people, people who made the world tremble because they had the outward advantages of Christianity and none of the faith. Now, to go back quite a bit earlier, we can think of the uh, expansion of Islam mm -hmm. um, during the, uh, the early Middle Ages. We, we are often asked, uh, well, isn't Islam a creative kind of culture because of this invention and that invention? What people <laughs> don't realize is that mostly... Well, Rachel, you want to take off from there? I see you shaking your head. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so what we see, if we actually go back and look into the first about 300 years of the Islamic empires, is that... All of the great inventions that we love to credit them for were actually created by the people they subjugated who were themselves Jews or Christians. And so their advancements in creating the first hospital was by a Christian. Their advancements in, or not even advancements, but use of sea power was because they forced people from Egypt to run their ships. And once those people were gone, the ships just sat in the water. And what we see by about 1000 is that the Muslims suddenly realized that they had lost their distinctiveness and they wanted to be more Muslim again. And that what they did was turn around and say, anything that's not Muslim and not Quran, we want to basically stamp out. And they did that and they've never recovered culturally. And most historians mm -hmm. can't figure out why. Mm -hmm. That when we started advancing in the West, they didn't, and they didn't try to join our advancements until the 1800s, and then they were just kind of smashing it on the top, and every single attempt they made pretty much failed because the people had no understanding of what all this stuff was that they were being given, and they had no value for it. And so their cultures as a whole got a few of the outward parts of the West in the 18 and 1900s, but it didn't help them, and instead we got the groundwork for modern terrorism that hates the West. You know, when I was a kid, uh, Islam was a joke. They, they were people who wore towels on their heads and rode camels. That's, that's what mm. all we knew about them because they were no threat. But about that same time, oil was being discovered. Mm. And we paid a lot for the oil. And these wealthy shahs and sultans and such had nothing better to do with the money than to send their kids out for an education, and they sent them to America. And they sent them wherever they could go. And since they were not necessarily intellectually talented in the beginning, they would send literally any college, any junior college would accept them. My junior college, which it's a nice, it was a nice college, but it was not prestigious by any means. We had another, a number of Muslim um, students who the professors generally didn't like, by and large. Um, but it was their their fathers were paying for a Western education, and of course, in engineering and mm. in the hard sciences. So we basically funded the rise of a generation that can work computers 
in Islamic territories because of oil. Now, God had all that planned, but, you know, it's the kind of thing that normally we call a cultural accident. It was certainly not part of their faith. Uh, their culture was not creative. And they, and once again, once we help out, once a, even a, 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 an apostate culture helps out a pagan culture, dangerous things can happen there. Mm -hmm. Free trade is one thing. Being smart is something else again. And this has warnings for us in the rise of Christless conservatism as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. As we're looking mm -hmm. at the benefits of a disciplined life mm -hmm. um, even now. There's, there are things coming. <laughs> you, can, you can just feel it. Well, and there are those that even on the non-Christian side that will pick up elements of Christianity and say, oh, I see its usefulness. I will now implement this part of it, but I don't mm -hmm. want the rest. And I think sometimes because we're looking for allies, we're too quickly satisfied with that and say, well, yes. they at least have my same moral code or... Uh huh. Any of those types of yeah things that yeah. don't really hold up in the long term. And it's important to draw distinctions of what I hesitate to use the word sphere because that's not really what I mean. But it's not like you can't be friends with these people. It's that the gospel is what's going to change hearts. And hearts are what need to be changed. Like we can think of Jonah going to Nineveh. He had a very simple message. <laughs> and it wasn't, hmm, you've got good technology here, but let me show you how to use it. That was not it. <laughs> it was not, yeah. oh, restore the nuclear family. That was not it either. No. No. Or discover your Noahic roots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or let us prove that the flood actually happened. <laughs> and there's an ark up there in the mountains someplace. And this is the things we waste our time on sometimes that are not the gospel. Mm -hmm. They may have their place, but they're not the gospel. And that brings us yeah. to the flood. Yeah. Do you realize there are still people, Christians, who don't think the flood was worldwide? I think I there's quite a few. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Just like I forget that there are Christians who don't believe the take the normal six day mm. view of creation and it's not That's like they're not christians group, they're I just think. they're just wrong <laughs> <laughs> um everybody knows where we stand on this podcast i think but um, uh, i hope so yeah well uh, yeah. some things along those lines if i can put my glasses off actually read the text in front of me and it came to pass after seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. That's the time of the waterfall. That's not how long the flood lasted. The flood lasted nearly a year. And skipping on a bit... Uh, they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. There had to be a reason for that, because if they could all just flee to the mountains or into the next valley, it wouldn't be mm -hmm. necessary. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. The waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, there is such a thing as viewing a scene locally and talking about all you can see is from where you're standing. However, if you're standing in Mesopotamia and all the high hills are covered, that water's going a long, 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 long way beyond the, those hills, because otherwise it won't cover them. It'll go down the mm -hmm. other side, and they won't be covered. It's not, the little hills were covered, but the mountains were bare. Now, the mountains, everything was underwater, and if that's so, then we're, we're dealing with, with something that is universal. 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. It was just the high hills. No, it was the mountains too. 
and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and beast and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man all in whose nostrils was a breath of life of all that was in the dry land died, and every living substance was destroyed which is upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and fowl of heaven. They were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. That's a level of specificity that precludes hyperbole, I think. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Peter says, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Uh, it's, it, it was a judgment upon the world. Now, things that can contribute to this, to our understanding of this, are little things like population growth, simple exponential population growth given two people in 656 years. You start getting millions of people, because we're told again and again every of the patriarchs had sons and daughters. So we're looking at four or five per family. That goes high real fast. By the seventh generation, we're pushing it. Uh, this is not some local, small, tiny population confined in, say, the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley or some such place. This is a worldwide population. And that's um, what God had said earlier, um, uh, back in, in chapter 6, um, the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then there's the whole thing of, and there's this boat. If it's not a universal flood, you tell Noah, get moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get beyond the mountains. Get it far as far away as you can, and you'll be safe. Uh, the the whole unless you want to assume, as many liberals have done, that these are primitive, stupid people who don't know their world is any bigger than the little river valley they're in. That uh, makes zero sense. <laughs> like, if yeah. you have somebody who's too primitive, you don't tell them to build a boat. You tell exactly. them to move. <laughs> they right. can walk. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So this is what we have. Now, there's also then we can look at archaeological data, um, fossils, um, land fossils, where they shouldn't be, ocean fossils on mountaintops. The, the whole forest that had been swept down and fossilized or turned to coal. The, the, this, this was the view of the church and of intellectuals in the West so Lyle came along with his uh, Uniformity of Natural Causes. Um, I forget the name of the book. Rachel, do you remember? I don't believe so off the top of my head. Mm, something simple like geology or something. Anyway, he, he was Darwin's um, mentor. And he was the first one to say, what if it wasn't the flood? What if all of these sediment levels that we see in canyons and such were laid down one at a time over a long, long time. Well, let's count how long that would be. Oh, let's say that would be millions of years. And then we don't need a flood to explain these things. This is just the normal way things developed. And he was very smart about one thing. At no point did he say, and therefore the Bible's wrong. Because mm -hmm. he knew if he said that, that would draw attention. He just said, here is an alternate hypothesis, a different way of looking at the data that will explain it just as well or better. And let's just think about what this would mean and he, he um, set the stage for Darwin to come along several years later and say, and let me tell you how life developed in terms of those millions of years. But there we're looking in the mid-1800s. To that point, people assumed a universal flood, and they assumed that, that weird geological formations and layers of silt that were stacked gigantically high were simply the result of the flood. They believed in a universal flood. Uh, now to suggest such a thing, um, if you put it in those terms, is right out. When when Lyle and Darwin and their their uh, cronies started this whole uh, macro evolution thing, the assumption was that no kind of catastrophe is allowed. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
Now we've got, they, they feel settled in enough that they're willing to allow some catastrophes, like <laughs> the asteroid strike that killed all the dinosaurs. 100 years ago, that would have been right out because that's a catastrophe. And by definition, uniformitarianism does not allow for catastrophes because if that kind of thing can happen, then we can't read the record and who knows what's going on. And we have to mm -hmm. be able to read the record because we're human and smart and rational and all that. So <laughs> we need to be able to explain it all. Yeah, exactly. We can't permit anything inexplainable. Yeah. And uh, the possibility that large parts of the earth were once covered with water fits into the system if you go back billions of years when the planet was first taking shape. I remember finding when I was a kid, and I think elementary school actually, I don't know what the book was. It might have been simply an encyclopedia or something, but it showed hypothetical different phases of the earth taking form of North America particularly, and showed how at one point this was underwater, and another point this was underwater, another point this was underwater. Sheer speculation. But it was in a text designed for, for older children to read as just matter of fact, this is the way it was. Like, yeah, you're not supposed to believe in even that kind of thing. But what can't happen is a flood sent by God in response to man's ethical sin. Mm -hmm. That's that's just unbelievable. If that there implies were a God, judgment. Yeah. If there were a God, he wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, he would not interfere. He would not need to interfere. He would not care to interfere. Um, thus, deism. Um, the Enlightenment... Uh, had his version of God, but it was not a God who could ever bring judgment. He was above such things, just as the uh, rational leaders were above um, petty moral judgments. Huge ethical judgments they made plenty, like France is evil and the monarch is evil and feudalism is <laughs> evil and all that. But, you know, who should be sleeping with whom was above their notice. And so they assumed above God's notice. Uh, and so we start just reading. Uh the brothers Karamazov, and mm. I got past the passage where one of the characters says, oh, the more I love mankind in general, the more I hate individual people <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> yep. And so we come to a new beginning because we got eight people left uh, and a renewed covenant that in the face of some of the theological trends we're seeing, I think we should just take a moment and note that the covenant that God made with Noah is the same covenant he completed with Noah after the flood. These are not two different covenants, one special grace, one common grace, or any such thing. The, the Bible is fond, actually, of reiterating God made a covenant with Abraham, and then with Isaac and with Jacob, and, and then sloshing all together and saying God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, that kind of thing. God made a covenant with his people at Sinai, and then in the next generation, God made a covenant with him, not with the people who came out of Egypt, but with you who are here right day to day. But it's the same covenant, covenant renewal uh, and, and rephrasing covenants and, and um, redefining them for the new situation is common in Scripture. And we can see and, specific continuities in yeah. the Noahic example of animal sacrifice after the flood, um, and God speaks of the curse on the ground, yeah, um, which is a callback to the curse on the ground in Genesis three. Um, well, so think there is, yeah. I think I've I particularly found the sacrifice aspect of it most compelling mm -hmm. because it reminded me that this covenant is beginning with the need for the shedding of blood, which means there is sin that needs to be dealt with first in this mm -hmm. covenant. And therefore, it's not just a generic covenant over all people, but it is particularly focused at those under the blood uh, that the covenant calls for. And that I think a lot of people pick up where God starts talking and they miss the foundation of why he's talking, where he smells the sweet savor, he is pleased. Yeah. And then he begins to talk. And I've heard yeah. people question whether there can be a distinction between interacting with Noah as the head of his family versus Noah as the head of all mankind. Like, is he the head of the church or of mankind in this situation? But this yes. happens at a specific time when they are, in fact, the, the same, same group of people. Yes. Right. So I don't think there's yeah. a need to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, these are the coveted people who have been saved by water. Peter says, 
uh, he calls the flood a type of baptism, and everyone on the ark was baptized. There are eight of them, the number of resurrection. Peter draws attention to that both of his epistles. Uh, to make this, and, and, and then there's the whole, this all begs the question of, is common grace, or whatever you want to call it, actually something separate and distinct from saving grace? And I would argue that they're not. Uh, co- what we call common, I don't like the phrase common grace, but I'll use it. Common grace is the overflow of special grace. When God comes and saves a people, he that the blessings overflow for the sake of those people and of his purposes and for the future. You can think of the wheat and the tares here. God does not pull up the wheat for the sake of the tares that are going to become wheat eventually. Uh, he blesses a the people in a nation of fundamentally godly people for the sake of the godly people, because he would bless his people and other people get the benefits. We all know the, the the benefits of growing up in a godly household, even when a child does not at first and perhaps never receive Christ as Savior. Uh, there, there is always this overflow of God's goodness and grace, which will make the person more accountable in the end, or maybe a means of uh, pushing him, leading him toward repentance, the goodness of God leading thee to repentance. To us, to assume that there is some kind of other grace, just cause, overlooks the the central. Well, you you said it, Emily. You said that the the whole planet, the whole cosmos, basically is tied up to man by covenant. Well, it's also tied up to Christ by covenant. Mm-hmm. There is no way that God considers creation outside of Christ now, unless He wants to consider just in Adam, which is not good. But he doesn't. He considers it in Christ, and um, all in him all things cohere. And so anything that happens anywhere in the universe is for Jesus' sake, mm-hmm. and therefore for the church's sake. And I would argue this ties into the later arguments in Romans, where Paul says, as in Adam all died, so in mm. Christ all are made alive. That's not a statement of universalism, but it is a statement about the category Mm-hmm. of mankind and everything bound to mankind by covenant. Yeah. And so with that as a background, we come into a new heaven and a new earth, but they've been completely transformed by the floodwaters. Uh, Adam, or Noah and his family have passed through a water boundary. They inherit a new heaven and a new earth, a new promised land. And things will go great now, right? Well, no, because God actually says in no uncertain terms, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore, because the imagination of man is evil from his youth. And we might be inclined to think, well, that's a good reason to keep on cursing things if man's, <laughs> if man from his youth is sinful. But no, the mm-hmm. point is the floods, externals, like destroying an entire world, aren't going to fix the sin problem. So... Check, we're, we're doing a checklist of things that won't work. Destroy humanity. Okay, that didn't work. That didn't solve the sin problem. <laughs> Not Put that man, God thought it would, but no. he wanted to show <laughs> us that it wouldn't. He wanted to show us that it would. Put man in a perfect uh, in outward environment with all of the right religious and moral trappings and have God live in their midst. That'll fix everything, Right. No. Okay. Well, let's scratch that one off the list. And when we go down the list of ways that we would try to fix the world, we see the God's tried them. As you say, not in the sense of actually seriously thought, thinking they would work, but he's, he's used these to push us step by step from spiritual kindergarten into the full light of the gospel when Jesus comes so that we know that all of our great ideas of how to fix things don't work. And that man needs a heart change. And so we start here, well, let's put, let's let the state have the sword and execute criminals, murderers particularly, and let's have a patriarchal sort of government, and let's spread out and have kids, and um, in a brand new world, undefiled by technology, (laughs) except whatever we carried over from the old world. And uh, So being Amish doesn't help. Saying so, yeah, being Amish doesn't help, or being um, and I know that's a noble a savage. Of what the Amish yes, oh, yes, is. yes. But yes. also, you joke. can't you can't just say, 
oh, we just need to be part of our good covenant family. That yeah. will fix us, which is <laughs> right. often very common. Let us just, mm-hmm. you know, go and be our own little family and do our own little thing on homeschool on a place, a you know, piece of property way out there. They were completely by themselves as a single family. And we only ever get really a spiritual assessment of Noah, mm-hmm. not of the rest. And we certainly don't get a good view of um, Ham. Yeah. Ham. And within about 125, 150 years, there are enough people around who, to decide that, in fact, this whole covenant family, God of Noah, creator God, Elohim, is not, that's not how we need to structure our society. <laughs> we need to identify ourselves. We need to self identify. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Um, okay. make us a name <laughs> and uh, unite, lest we be scattered abroad. They they refused to believe God's promise, and they wanted to unite, and they so they formed. And, and oftentimes we skip over the fact that they formed a city. Mm-hmm. Um, the city the, came first. The city and the city is built around what we call a ziggurat. Mm-hmm. The language is is sort of vague, and yet it's clear enough if you ignore what's been supplied by the translators, they say, um, let us build us a city and a tower whose top is unto heaven. Now, the translators supplied may reach into heaven. That gives the idea that they're trying to build it up really high, and some people have speculated, so they could get above flood waters if they came back. That's not what they're saying. <laughs> the heaven they're talking about is not the sky. They're talking about where God lives. Mm-hmm. They wanted to build a, re- a magical artifact that would bring them into heaven itself. That would the that fundamental would deal- unit of government of the world. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but we have to stop there because we're out of time. Well, that's a good place to stop. So yeah, can we'll talk more about the ziggurat next time. Oh, okay. I look forward to it very much. I have notes from. Uh, my freshman year of college when I was taking Western heritage. And it's just like, it all it's all ziggurats all the time, everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah. Including so I'm world. excited about next yeah. week. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. It's been a delight. I've learned a lot. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thanks also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get a hold of us with any comments, questions, bouquets, brickbats, uh, halting towards Zion at gmail.com is the best way to reach us. Uh, this has been a production of Diecast Media Group. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.